In section 1.2, we already discussed several connections between integer programming and linear programming. In this section, we will see another fundamental connection. We start by defining convex ALS, then we take the convex ALS of a mixed integer linear set, and this will allow us to define perfect formulations and to point out this connection between linear programming and integer programming that is fundamental from a theoretical perspective. We start by defining a convex set. A subset S of Rn is said to be convex if, for any two distinct points in the set S, the line segment joining them is also in S. Let's immediately look at an example. The set here on the left is convex, while the set on the right is not convex. To see that the set on the left is convex, we look at any two points x and y in the set and we look at the corresponding line segment joining them. It seems clear from the picture that no matter how you pick x and y, the whole segment will be contained in S, therefore this set is convex. On the other hand, let's now look at the set Q on the right. If we pick x over here and y over here, then you can immediately see that the line segment joining them is not fully contained in the set Q, therefore the set Q is not convex. Now, how do we write algebraically the fact that the line segment joining two points is in the set? To do so, we construct the point lambda x plus 1 minus lambda y for any lambda between 0 and 1. This gives you precisely all the points in the line segment joining x and y. For example, for lambda equal to 1, this is precisely the point x. For lambda equal to 0, this is precisely the point y. And for lambda being equal to 1 half, this is the midpoint between x and y. Next, we can define the convex hull of a set S. The convex hull of S is defined as the minimal convex set containing S, and we denote the convex hull of S by conv S. Now, when we say minimal in this definition, this means minimal inclusion-wise. A nice constructive way to look at this definition is the following. Let's pick all the convex set containing S, and let's intersect them all. The intersection of convex sets is also convex, and so this intersection is a convex set containing S. Furthermore, by construction, it is the minimal inclusion-wise convex set containing S. We have an example down here. On the left, we have a set of five points S, and on the right, we have the corresponding convex hull of S. In this slide, we have an example of the convex hull of a pure integer linear set. On the left, we have our pure integer linear set. It is the set of integer points that satisfy few linear inequality constraints. Of course, we have non-negativity on x1 and x2. Then we have the inequality x1 less than or equal to 5. And then this other linear inequality over here. Now, if we pick the convex hull of all these integer points, we obtain this set here on the right. And note that it can be described with four linear inequality constraints. One is x2 greater than or equal to 0. One is x1 less than or equal to 5. And note that both these inequalities were present in the description of the polytope P here on the left. But then we have two additional linear inequalities. This one and this one. In this slide, instead, we have an example of the convex hull of a mixed integer linear set. The mixed integer linear set is described, of course, by no negativity on x and y, and then only one linear inequalities. The line corresponding to this inequality intersects the x-axis on this point beta, and then it goes up in this direction. As always, x is integer and y is continuous. So the points in our mixed integer linear set are these vertical half lines. This one is the first, then we have the second one over here, then the third is this one over here, the fourth is this one, and so on and so forth, we will have infinitely many of these half lines. 
Now the convex hull of this mixed integer linear set is simply obtained by adding one linear inequality. And it is this inequality over here, which intersects the x-axis on the point floor of beta, and then it goes up in this direction in such a way that it touches this point over here in S. Next, we want to characterize convex using convex combinations. Essentially, we will come up with an equivalent definition of convex hull. So let's define a convex combination. A point X in Rn is a convex combination of points in S if there exists a finite set of points x1 until xp in S and corresponding scalars lambda1 until lambda p such that x can be written as the sum of the lambda j xj and the lambda j are non-negative and sum to 1. Note that, few slides ago, we already saw an example of a convex combination. In the definition of convex set, when we wrote algebraically the line segment joining two points, x and y, we wrote precisely the convex combination of the two points, x and y. In that case, we only had two points, so we had lambda 1 and lambda 2, non-negative, that sum to 1. Since they sum to 1, lambda 2 is equal to 1 minus lambda 1, and so now this sum becomes lambda 1 x1 plus 1 minus lambda 1 x2, which is precisely the formula that we saw a few slides ago. Now I leave as an exercise for you to prove the following characterization of the convex hull of S. Recall that by definition the convex hull of S is the minimal convex set containing S. I ask you to show that equivalently the convex hull of S is the set of points in Rn that are convex combinations of points in S. We are now ready to work our way towards the connection between integer programming and linear programming that I promised you at the beginning of this video. The key idea is that optimizing a linear function over S, as we do in integer programming, is equivalent to optimizing it over conv S. Let's formally state this idea in lemma 1.3. Let S be a subset of Rn and let C be a vector in Rn. Then the supremum of Cx subject to x in S is equal to the supremum of Cx subject to x in conv S. Recall that the supremum of Cx subject to x in S is defined as the smallest upper bound on Cx for x in S. In other words, it is the least number z in R such that z is greater than or equal to Cx for every x in S. I also remind you that the supremum is said to be attained if there exists a vector x bar in S such that the supremum of Cx subject to x in S is precisely equal to C x bar. Now that we refreshed our memory about supremum, let's go back to the statement of lemma 1.3. We saw that the lemma states that the supremum of Cx for x in S is equal to the supremum of Cx for x in convex. But the lemma also states that the supremum of Cx is attained over S even only if it is attained over the convex hull of S. Now let's prove lemma 1.3. Ok, so in lemma 1.3 there are two things we need to show. First we need to prove the equality over here and then we need to prove the sentence uh, below. Ok, so let's start with uh, the equality among the two supremums. So we prove uh, separately the two corresponding inequalities. Let's start with the inequality uh, less than or equal to and this follows directly from the fact that uh, S the set S is contained in the set conv S. So follows from S contained in conv S. OK, so we need to show the other inequality. To do so, let's define uh, a value Z star. So let Z star be the supremum of Cx such that x in S. So this is exactly the value 
here of the supremum on the left. We assume that Z star is smaller than plus infinity, otherwise this inequality follows trivially. Now we define a half space corresponding to Z star. Let H be the set of points in Rn such that Cx less than or equal to Z star. This is a half space, so H is clearly convex. H is convex. Also, by definition of Z star, we have that S is contained in H. Therefore, also the convex hull of S is contained in H, and this holds by definition of convex hull. Because the convex hull is the intersection of all the convex sets containing S, and H is a convex set containing S. And this allows us to write that the supremum of Cx for x in conv S is less than or equal to the supremum of Cx such that x in H, which is precisely Z star. And so we obtained the inequality that we needed to show. We have now completed the proof of the equality in lemma 1.3. Now we need to prove the sentence below, which says that the supremum of Cx is attained over S if and only if it is attained over convex. One direction follows directly since convex contains S. Let's write it down. Let x bar in S such that supremum of Cx for x in S is equal to c x bar. Well, then we have x bar in conv s and the supremum over conv s is attained by x bar. So now, to finish the proof, we only need to show the reverse implication, which says that if the supremum over convex is attained, then also the supremum over S is attained. To do so, we will use our characterization of convex halves. So, let X bar in conv S such that the supremum of Cx for x in conv s is equal to c x bar. Now we are going to use our characterization of convex halves. We write x bar as the sum of uh, lambda i x i, say for i that goes from 1 to k. In this equality, we have uh, x1 until xk in S and uh, all the lambdas, uh, so lambda 1 until uh, lambda k, greater than or equal to 0, with uh, the sum of lambda i equal to 1. Now note that we can assume that the lambdas are strictly positive instead of non-negative, because in the sum defining x bar, we can just throw away the addends i with lambda i equal to 0. So instead of lambda i greater than or equal to 0, we write lambda i strictly larger than 0.
Now the idea is that any of these points x1 until xk will attain the maximum over s. Let's see why. We write c x bar as c sum of i equal to 1 until k of the lambda i xi. Now we bring c inside the sum, so this is the sum for i from 1 to k of lambda i c xi. And now from the definition of x bar, we know that c xi is less than or equal to c x bar for every i. So we have less than or equal to c x bar that now can go outside of the sum and in the sum we are only left with the lambda i's. The sum of the lambda i's is 1 and so this is equal to c x bar. So let me first uh, write down what we used in the inequality here. So where we used c x i less than or equal to c x bar for every i from 1 to k. And this holds from the definition of x bar. So what have we obtained in this formula? We started from c x bar and we obtain something equal to it, then something equal to it, then we obtain something greater than or equal to it, and we showed at the end that this something is exactly equal to c x bar once again. So at the end of the day, we show that c x bar is less than or equal to c x bar, which seems useless, but in fact, this means that the inequality that we have in our chain here must be an equality. In this inequality, we used the inequality cxi less than or equal to cx bar for every i. Therefore, all these inequalities must be equalities as well. cxi is equal to cx bar for every i from 1 to k. That's what we just showed. Which means that the supremum over s is attained by x1 until xk. And this concludes our proof of the lemma. Let's now go back to the slides. Now that we've proved the lemma 1.3, we can work out our connection between integer programming and linear programming. So let's pick a mixed integer linear set S, defined as usual. So S is the set of points x, y in z, n plus times r, p plus, such that ax plus g, y less than or equal to b. Here it will be fundamental to assume that a, g and b have rational entries. It is a fundamental result of integer programming that we will see in chapter 4 that the convex hull of S can be written as a set of points x, y in r, n times r, p such that a prime x plus g prime y less than or equal to b prime for some matrices and vectors a prime g prime b prime with rational entries. In other words, the set convex can be described with rational linear inequality constraints. In our examples of convex hull, we already saw that this indeed happened. But of course, this very general statement requires a proof and we're gonna see this again in chapter 4. So now let's get back to lemma 1.3. It says that the supremum of cx plus hy, such that xy is in S, is equal to the supremum of the same function over xy in convex. Now the feasible region on the left is a mixed integer linear set, and the feasible region on the right is a rational polyhedron. So our connection is almost there. On the left we have something very similar to an integer program, and on the right something very similar to a linear program. However, there's a small problem. We're looking here at the supremum in both of these problems rather than a maximum, which is what we look at in integer programming and linear programming. 
So let's see how we can switch this supremum for maximums. Now from the theory of linear programming, the supremum over a polyhedron is always achieved. Therefore, we know that the supremum of this set is equal to the maximum of this set. And now we can apply lemma 1.3 once again, but now we look at the second part of the statement, which says that if one of the two supremum is attained, then so is the other one. Now here we have just understood that the supremum on the right is attained, therefore from lemma 1.3 we can conclude that also the supremum on the left is attained, and therefore we can replace a supremum with maximum also on the left. Now if we read through our equality signs, we have shown that the maximum of Cx plus Hy subject to Xy in S is equal to the maximum of the same function over xy in convex. On the left we have an integer program and on the right we have a linear program. Therefore, to solve the integer program on the left, it suffices to solve the linear program on the right. Of course, from a complexity perspective, we have a problem here, because the problem on the left is NP-hard and the problem on the right is polynomially solvable. The catch here is that we cannot construct efficiently the set conv S starting from S. So a central question in integer programming is the constructive aspect of this linear program. Given A, G and B, which define the linear inequalities corresponding to the original mixed integer linear set S, how can one compute A prime, G prime and B prime? which give the linear inequalities which define the convex hull of S? Throughout this course we will go in much detail to discuss this question. Our discussion also allows us to define perfect formulations. Now it is clear that the system A'x plus G'y less than or equal to B' also provides a formulation for the mixed integer linear set S. What does it mean? It means that the set S, which was originally written as a set of points xy in Zn plus times Rp plus such that Ax plus Gy less than or equal to B, can also be written as the set of points xy once again in Zn plus times Rp plus such that A prime X plus G prime Y less than or equal to B prime. So essentially I replace the original polyhedron with the new polyhedron that is the convex hull of S. Now this new formulation is much better than the previous one, at least with respect to our connection between integer programming and linear programming. In fact, we have just seen that the integer program with feasible region S can simply be solved with an LP whose feasible region is precisely A prime X plus G prime Y less than or equal to B prime. Essentially, if we are given this second formulation for S, we can just trash the integrality constraints and solve the corresponding linear program. We are then guaranteed to obtain an optimal solution not only for the linear program, but also for the integer program. This is because every vertex of the convex hull of S will be in S. The second formulation over here is so important that it deserves a name. We're gonna call it a perfect formulation. Accordingly, we also have a special name for the set defined by the linear inequalities A prime X plus G prime Y less than or equal to B prime in the case where we have no continuous variables, therefore in the pure integer case. So, when there are no continuous variables y, the set of points x in Rn such that a prime x less than or equal to b prime, defined by a perfect formulation, is called an integral polyhedron. The reason it is called an integral polyhedron is because every vertex will be an integer point. This concludes our video about convex hulls and perfect formulations.